The title of the message this morning is called Lord of Breakings Through. And we're going to uncover some things out of 2 Samuel 5, starting in verse 17. But for some of you, that title may throw you into some, you know, grammar, bad grammar conniptions, okay? Because it just doesn't quite sound right. The Lord of breakings through. But I'm going to explain that because this title is the meaning of the place or location called Baal Parazim. This place was named by King David in a couple of battles fought with the Philistines. And we can read this account together. So if you will, let's dig into the Word because we've got some interesting stuff that I I think uh, we'll have fun with here today. 2 Samuel 5, 17 through 20 reads like this. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David. Now understand they weren't seeking him to give him a high five or to congratulate him on being the king anointed, okay? They were seeking him to destroy him. So they came up to seek David and David heard of it and went down to the hold. He went down to the stronghold. What was it that David had been accustomed to doing? He ran to the battle, did he not? Here again, we see the heart of David. Written in the word, he hears that the enemy is seeking him. He goes right to it. He goes down to the hold. Keep reading with me in verse 18. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David, verse 19, very important, read and listen. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, two questions. Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into my hand? Smart guy. He went. He sees a battle. He hears of a battle. He goes down to face the enemy. And then he prays. He said, shall I go up, Lord? And, Lord, answer me another question while you're at it. Will I prevail? Will I win? Are you going to be with me? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to Balparazim, and David smote them there, and said, The Lord has broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Balparazim. Balparazim is a Hebrew word, comes from two words, Baal, which means to be Lord, and Perez, to break or breach. Thus, the name Balparazim means Lord of breakings through. It can also mean possessor of breaches. The meaning of this place is significant and it is totally relevant with the timely word being brought to us right now here today. Our Lord is a breakthrough God. Amen? And he does own the title of being the possessor of breaches. He owns it. He is the possessor of breaches. He is the one that will go forth before us. And he will allow and provide the breakthrough. Can I get an amen? The Lord who 
punches through the walls of any difficulty, of any challenge, of any situation, of any pain, of anything that we have need of. He is the one. He is ours. Because he said, I'm Lord of breakings through. I am possessor of breaches. I am the one that will make that hole for you. Can I get an amen? Are we understanding this was significant? David did what he knew to do. He did what he was following the Lord's voice to do. He had inquired. He saw the enemy. And he didn't just run away. He went. But he first prayed and said, Are you with me, Lord? Shall I go up? And the Lord answered Does not God's word today speak loudly to us? And does it not say, my sheep, the words of Jesus, hear my voice? So, can we do this same thing? Absolutely. Can we hear that same affirmation that doubtless I will fight for you? Doubtless. And David named that place Balparazim because the Lord broke forth. Lord of breakings through. The Lord broke forth upon the enemies of Israel as the breach of waters. There's some good stuff here, okay? So stay with me here. And we're going to come right back to this scripture here in a minute, but Let me first just bring some clarity to this title, okay? A breakthrough is a military concept, really. Webster's Dictionary defines it like this. It is a strikingly important advance or discovery in any field of knowledge or activity, as in warfare against resistance. When one army is able to weaken its enemy's forces to the point of collapse, a breakthrough occurs. Am I right? Allowing that army to invade and take its enemy's territory. But in war, a breakthrough, hear me now, only really matters if it occurs at a strategic location. I mean, that's pretty simple to understand. If you have a breakthrough, if you cross the enemy line and it's in a place where there's not even really any enemy, it's not really considered a breakthrough. It's not really a strategic point. And the evidence that a location is strategic is almost always revealed by the amount of enemy forces amassed to protect it. An enemy led by skilled generals plans to ferociously protect what it prizes highly. Now keep all of this in the mind and in the context of spiritual warfare. When the enemy sees that you're making advance, when the enemy sees that you're opening your mouth and speaking and declaring the promises of God, the enemy will provide opposition. It's just going to happen because you are a strong point that would like, the enemy would like to defeat. So this means that An invading army can expect its attempts to achieve a breakthrough to be met by a barrier of fierce enemy opposition. Here's an example again. If we, as a church here, are to be considered, if our vision as a house of prayer and intercession is ever going to be met, and it is, We are going to meet opposition from Satan 
to prevent that from happening. It is, and we've seen it, that is something the enemy comes against hard. Trying to distract, trying to throw things in here to prevent us from making a breakthrough. Increasingly intense fighting always precedes strategic breakthroughs. Hear me? Strategic ground is not yielded easily. We do have a battle. We do have a race. We talked about that race and finishing well last week. That is something that we need to continue in. We must understand that our breakthroughs are opposed by powerful forces. But the good news is that God has no equals. <laughs> the good news is that we are a part of his army that is destined to win. In fact, I've read the back of the book, and it says we win, okay? I know what our destiny will and can be, and that opposition is not going to win, but it will be there. Now, go to the next screen for me. I want us to track back for just a moment into the first book of Samuel so that we can understand the text of this battle that David fought where he named the place Valparaiso. Okay? In 1 Samuel chapter 3, and I'm going to paraphrase quite a bit of this here, but in 1 Samuel chapter 3, we begin reading about how the Lord called Samuel as a young boy. He's in the house, uh, the the high priest Eli, he's in the house there, and we recall the story of Samuel hearing the voice of God, even at a time when it says in God's word that the voice, the vision of the Lord was very rare at that time. If you heard, if there was something that was spoken, boy, it was special. Samuel was hearing the voice of the Lord. There was something about to be revealed, and Samuel kept on hearing a voice calling his name, Samuel, Samuel. And we know again that that voice spoke of warnings that he had to relay to the high priest Eli of what judgments were to come because of the indiscretions of his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. So we continue chapter 4 of 1 Samuel. We see Israel now going out against the Philistines to battle, but getting beaten badly. So, so badly that in verse 3 of chapter 4, it details that the elders of Israel lamented their defeat and decided they made a decision to pull the Ark of the Covenant into the battle. Bad decision by the elders. Bad decision by the leadership there. Because the Ark of the Covenant symbolized the ruling presence of God among his people. It was not meant to be an item of idolatry or some figure that this is what brings the victory. The Ark of the Covenant represented the ruling presence of God Almighty. And the leaders decided, well, let's bring it into battle because, well, I think that's going to help us here. It was housed in the Holy of Holies, the Ark of Covenant was. And the sons of Eli had the commission to take care of the tabernacle, but they also were the ones written in the word here that allowed the elders of Israel to take it out. They removed it from where it was supposed to be. This is significant. 
You don't take things that are holy to God Almighty and move them into places for your convenience. This was not something that they had inquired of the Lord. This was not something, again, it was just simply a bad decision. Verse 5 through 11 reads like this. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. And listen, when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. Verse 7, and the Philistines were afraid. For they said, God is come into the camp. And they said, the Philistines said, woe unto us. For there has not been such a thing before. Woe unto us. Who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Philistines. Evil. Picture this. Evil generation. Evil people understood who God was and what he could do. And when they heard the shout that the Ark of the Covenant was being brought into the camp, their response was, verse 9, be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter for their fellow of Israel, 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. The bad day in the camp of Israel. Chapter 4 ends with Eli falling off his seat, dying, when he hears the news of his son's death and that the ark was taken. He had a daughter-in-law that was giving birth at that time. Also, she passed away as she gave birth to Ichabod. In verse 22, she said, the glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. So here we have a dismal picture. Israel was whipped badly. They had made a decision to bring the Ark of the Covenant in to a battle. They weren't instructed to do so. And it provided defeat. Now the Ark is gone. This is a bad day in the camp. Chapter 5 continues of the almost funny accounts of what happens to the Philistines as they park this newly acquired treasure into their cities. And I say almost funny because I'm not laughing at their calamities. But as we go into chapter 5, it is almost ridiculous what happens because they had possession, unrightful, unlawful possession of a holy thing. Chapter 5 says the ark first lands in Ashdod and brought into the house of Dagon, which was their fertility god. The first night that the ark is in this house of Dagon in the city of Ashdod, uh, finds uh, the morning uh, with Dagon on its face. Okay, here's a big idol flat on its face. Who done it? What's going on? Okay, they bring it back up, they put it back on its pedestal, second night, go to the next morning, it's not only down on its face, but also the head and both palms of Dagon's hands are cut off, leaving only the stump. <laughs> Stop a minute. This, to me, is thrilling to think 
that the pure holiness of God Almighty in that Ark of the Covenant where it represented as a symbol the ruling presence of God Almighty was not going to stand with another idol. And Dagon, who did it? We know God did it because nobody else as it says in here that they came in sneaking away like, kind of like what Gideon did when he had to go up and cut down the idols uh, in the high places there. No. Dagon. Just flat on its face here. So what happens here? Verse 6 of chapter 5 says that the people also were smitten with emeralds. These are like tumors. They're like nasty, very severe boils, okay? And they called it emerald. So they sent it over from Ashdod. They sent it over to Gath, okay? And verse 9 reads, And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds in their secret parts. Again, this is just almost ridiculous, just crazy stuff going on in their cities where they were trying to place this holy ark of the covenant. Next stop, Ekron. And guess what? Okay, The Ekronites cried out saying they have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. You simply cannot take a holy, consecrated thing into your place without experiencing consequences. You will either be destroyed by it or you will surrender to it and you will be changed. The five lords of the Philistines eventually realized this. And they developed a plan to put the ark on a wagon, put two milk cows in front of it to pull it, and point them on the road to the nearest city of the Israelites to send it out of their land. We read 1 Samuel 6, verses 16 through 18, that they received the cart into the field of Joshua, a Bethshemite. Read with me. And when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. They were glad to say, good riddance. We don't want anything to do with this miserable thing here. We don't know how to handle it here. And it says, these are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord. For Ashdod, one. For Gaza, one. For Ascalon, one. For Gath, one. For Ekron, one. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both of fenced cities and of country villages, even under the great stone of Abel, whereon they set down the ark of the Lord, which stone remaineth unto this day in the field of Joshua the Beshemite. Here's what they did. They made gold emerald. They made gold uh, tumors. They put them on the ark as their sin offering, saying maybe the God of Israel will forgive us. Maybe he'll let us go and quit bothering us. They made golden mice, and that's what they put on the ark as they sent it off here. Now, here's an interesting point about these five lords who had these five cities named after them. We mentioned one already, the city of the Lord of the Philistines, Ashdod. The name Ashdod means pride, a city on a hill. Gaza is the name of a second Philistine lord, a second city. That name, Gaza, means self-rule. I am in charge. It was also the capital city of the Philistines. Third lord of the Philistines, Ascalon, the third city. That name, Ascalon, means 
greed and selfishness, synonymous with prosperity and fertility. Gath, a fourth one, the name means distractions. And the fifth one, Ekron, it means contamination. Ekron, that name meaning contamination, meant something to these people back in that day. Because in order to torture a prisoner, they would contaminate the person by strapping or binding a dead person to a live prisoner, making that live prisoner, forcing them to be carrying mouth to mouth, however they had it bound. This was their torture, evil stuff. This was the name of that fifth lord, Ekron. It meant contamination. They understood what they were doing because that prisoner, the live prisoner, would eventually succumb to death of whatever that dead prisoner had died of. Just some nasty stuff, silly stuff that, that goes on, okay? And that even brings into light here kind of a separate rabbit hole here, okay? But in Romans 7, 24, Paul even understood what they were doing back then and could be that this even relates to some of that understanding. Romans 7, 24 says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And of course, we know he's talking about the sin and the death that, that is being experienced here, but he also, I'm sure, had that understanding of the torturous way that they would take a prisoner and contaminate a person with by strapping a dead body to them. Wretched. Again, back up out of that rabbit hole, okay? But also, just one more. I'm going to go back in. Interesting about this last city, Ekron. The god of that city, Ekron, was Beelzebub. The name Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies. Now, did you know that the average lifespan of a fruit fly is about 40 days? That might be significant because Jesus fasted, prayed, and was tempted in the wilderness for how many days? 40 days. And the religious leaders of his time accused Jesus, Jesus of having a spirit of Beelzebub, Matthew 12, 24. Hmm. Seems to me that Jesus defeated Beelzebub quite well during his 40 days of temptation. Again, things in God's word that he can bring to light giving us understanding that God's Word is absolutely certain and true. Amen? So why talk about so much about these names and these events happening with the Philistines? The reason is because everything in the Old Testament points to the new. Everything happening, all of these situations, all of these... the even names, give us understanding of the things that Jesus Christ came to defeat or to set us free, to give us the liberty that we needed. It is critical for us today to understand that the Lord of breakings through, that possessor of breaches, needs a vessel, needs you and I, that is willing in order to cleanse it and to fill it. Things such as pride, self-rule, greed and selfishness, distractions, 
contaminations, things like that that the lords and the names of the lords of the Philistines represented have no place and do not carry well with the ark of God. Go to that next screen here. We've been talking about the ark of the covenant, the ark of the God Almighty. But what does it say in the New Testament? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Let's go to that and read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17. Let's read. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, his purpose was to set man free and to reconcile man back to God. He had to do it by take, having his own life provided as that blood sacrifice, as that lamb that gave us the change over to the new covenant here. And so that Ark of the Covenant, that ruling presence of God in the midst of his people, now moved inside of us. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now this is, again, stuff that we can see through his word, but we have to be able to take that now and apply it so that we know what authority that we have, just as in that Ark of the Covenant that was messing with people and providing all sorts of trouble and things like that, that same authority has been given to us to declare the word and the promises of God. It says that we do have that same authority. Jesus even said that greater works that I do shall you do because I go to the Father. There's so much in God's Word that gives us the understanding that we as conquerors, as an overcoming army of Christ, we can oppose the forces of darkness. Read with me in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but Paul starts out and he's Addressing to the Ephesians, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Because Jesus now lives in us. He said, Now you be strong. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, and he gives us the armor, he gives us the direction, the armor of God that we need to have with our loins girt about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with preparation of gospel of peace, shield of faith that we can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, helmet of salvation, sword of the Spirit, Praying always, here it is, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. The church, we as individuals and as a family of God are an invading force. We do have a presence. In this world, as we take ourselves into prayer each and every day. And although we can easily slip into a defensive, kind of circle the wagons kind of a, a mindset, 
Jesus clearly intends for us to be the aggressors, not merely defenders. Amen? We need to run to the hold. We need to do as David did, and he ran forth to meet the giant. Don't hold back because our God is the Lord of breakings through. He is going before us. He is ready to punch that hole through the walls of whatever it is that we are invading. Amen? In a world that lies in the power of the evil one, as it says in 1 John 5, 19, that's militant language. That's definitely just identifies our mission. And that is to liberate those that the devil has taken captive to do his will. And if we are praying for a breakthrough and not seeing it at the moment, do not give up. Opposition precedes breakthroughs. We must keep in mind that the strategic ground The battles that truly are important to win aren't going to be given up easily. Whether we're battling for for breakthroughs against our own stubborn sin or the unbelief of a loved one or breakthroughs or in the visional advance of our church, reaching unreached peoples, rescuing persecuted believers, orphans, addicts, unborn, we are up against as it was read in verse 12 of Ephesians 6, we are up against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Look at the example of Daniel, chapter 10, where it says that he was given a brief glimpse of what's happening here. He'd been praying and partially fasting for 21 days to gain greater insight into the revelation that he had received earlier. When an angel finally showed up and said, your prayers are answered 21 days later. You see, it says that the prince of the kingdom of Persia was delaying that answer. Principalities, things going on in spiritual darkness that we just simply have to trust and we have to know God is moving on our behalf. He is the possessor of breaches. He will punch through for us. You know, and that experience of Daniel doesn't mean that we've now got a formula that we can do 21 days prayer and fasting and then boom, you'll see it happen. We need to seek the Lord. And whatever it takes, we are going to see it come through here. It's an example of what's taking place outside of our sight. God wants us to know that there's more going on that, than we see so that we will continue to pray, continue to hold fast. When God moves, he is invading what Satan considers his territory. God's kingdom is breaking through the lines of the domain of darkness as it reveals in Colossians 1, verse 11 through 13. It says, Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. There's our promise that we hold to. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. And here's just a good dose of reality. Spiritual, real spiritual breakthroughs aren't achieved without prayer. Truly, if you've got something that you really need 
or desire, you know that's true. True spiritual breakthrough is going to come through much prayer. Prayer is necessary to weaken our opposition. And if we aren't encountering opposition, it's probably because we aren't attacking a strategic location. But if we are, we're on to something. Where the enemy is fortifying his forces is where we must amass, where we must gather and go after the enemy here. There's going to be a fierce fight. We're going to receive those volleys of, of flaming darts as we read in Ephesians 6, 16. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16 and 9, he says, For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. You see what he just said? He said, there's a lot of open doors. There's a lot of open heaven. There's a lot of open portals that are coming through. But there are also many adversaries. We're going to be attacked on the rear. Just what it is. There will be spies in the camp. There will be jeering and mocking and intimidation and accusations. There will be efforts to destroy our morale and our determination. But as it was promised in Deuteronomy 4, verse 29 through 31, listen to the word of the Lord. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. When thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shall be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee. Oh boy, take that again to heart. Deuteronomy 4, 29 through 31 here. He will not forsake thee. Neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swear unto them. This message is a call for holy determination, holy grit. Get tough, get real, knowing that our God is right there ready to punch that wall of opposition there. Luke 18, verse 1 says, Jesus had spoken a parable to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. These are words of Jesus. If he said and gave a command like that, then always know that that vision, those words always carry a provision. He's enabled you. He's equipped you. He's given you what it takes to be able to do it. Amen? And just like in any large-scale war, there are many battles. Some breakthroughs are achieved real quickly. Praise God. Others require long, persevering endurance. But either way, breakthroughs require a determination to keep up the assault. Always remember the promise found in 1 John 4 and 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Jesus also spoke in John 16, 33, and he says these things I've spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's go to that next screen here. In summary, and kind of a wrap-up, of some of the takeaways of this message. 
we talked a bunch about the Ark of the Covenant, and we may go into a, another time, another message about really what was in the Ark of the Covenant, what made it special, what all represented the things of that time, how they pointed to Jesus, how they pointed to the New Covenant, to the New Testament, some interesting stuff we're not going to get into here today here. But understand that that Ark of the Covenant, the ruling presence of God, was something very significant. So significant that it was housed, remember, in the tabernacle, the tent, in the Holy of Holies. And in that place, again, was where that veil was established. And that is where, again, we saw that veil be torn right down the middle when Jesus Christ died on the cross. That means that a new covenant was established. The blood had been poured out, and now we have a greater covenant, a greater promise, more things that are going to be available to us here. The Ark of the Covenant was the place of presence. And we know that while the Lord was present among his people in the Exodus, that he localized this presence in the tabernacle for the benefits of the people. And the tabernacle was constructed just right so that it could travel and be with the people, just as he had commanded them to do it. But the thing that I find interesting is in Exodus 25 and 22. I want us to go to that. Exodus 25 and 22 is where he says this talking about the Ark of the Covenant. He says, And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the Ark of the Testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. This is, again, some very good news. It is very good stuff because now we know that as we are a temple of the most holy God, he has come inside. Jesus Christ said, if any man will open the door, I will come in. And I will enter him, and I will sup with him. These are things that now give us the assurance and the confidence and the joy knowing our God is right here with me going forth as Lord of breakings through here. And I want to end with going back to that second Samuel as I promised where the battle the place of the location David named it Valparaiso second Samuel 6 he named that place Valparaiso and in verse 22 read with me second Samuel 6:22 and the Philistines came up yet again do you think that because they were defeated once that they would have just stopped? No. That's not how things work. You may have gotten a healing. You may have gotten a deliverance. You may have been set free from something. And you've got the victory. And you give God the, the, the thanks for that victory. But what happens when the enemy comes back around again? 
The Philistines did this. Verse 22 says the Philistines came back and they spread themselves again in that same valley of Rephaim. Verse 23, and when David inquired of the Lord, he said, thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, then that thou, then thou shalt bestir thyself, for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so, as the Lord had commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gezer. <laughs> Here it is. Once again, the example. David sees the enemy a second time. He's already seen the Lord move for him. He's already seen and named the place Valparaisum. God is my Lord of breaking through. He's with me. They come up again. Same thing. Pray. Lord, what do I do? Do I go up? But just because the Lord told you to do something one way, one time, that doesn't mean that that's what's going to need to be done a second time. He may direct you to something different. What's our part? We are a temple of the Holy Ghost, able to hear the voice of the Master. Pray. Ask the Lord. Inquire. Say, Lord, speak to me. Talk to me. This is something that every day in our lives, as a part of our daily walk with the Lord, we need to get down real, real good. So that when the enemy comes up a second time, we can say, Lord, listen, do it again. Your testimony, Lord, is you've already beat this enemy once. Don't quite get why this is happening again. Some of you in here might think, I don't know why there's just trouble just keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming on me. Trust God. If you truly put yourself into the hands of the Lord, he's going to speak again. And this time, he gave David a different word. He said, fetch a compass. That means circle back around. Take your little thing and circle around here. Come up behind them. You've got them. And that's exactly what happened. Listen for the voice of the Lord. I firmly believe that we as a church, as individuals, as Christians today, we need to have a change of expectation. Hear me. We need to have a change of expectation. I'm going to say it a third time. We need to have a change of expectation of what our God's going to do because he is with us. He will never fail us. He said he can't fail us. Even when we don't see that he's working, he's still with us. He cannot fail us. He won't fail us. He's been faithful. He is faithful and true to the end here. We have been given power and authority through the name of Jesus Christ to hear the voice of the Lord and to overcome. Can we stand? Because that's good news. Can we give God an amen? All right?